Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Steel Flyers All Sports Network. We got a special show here for you lined up. We got the NHL West Division Trade Deadline Preview Show, and we've got a very special guest joining in for us. Uh, he's from out west, and how about that? We got the Anthony Deli Tweets. How you doing, buddy? How you doing? Doing well. Thanks for the invite. I'm I'm happy to be on. Uh, you guys have been doing some great work, so I'm I'm excited to uh, to have a conversation with you. Awesome. That's great, man. Uh, we tapped into you because you happen to be a West Coast uh, resident. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Happily living on the beach near uh, near L.A. Anaheim area, so right in the thick of things down here. Awesome sauce, awesome sauce, man. Thank you very much for being here and taking your time out of your day to be with us, man. We really appreciate it. We got the great Perlo Wisdom. How you doing, Perlo? Freaking amazing, dude. This is uh, awesome being able to do this and uh, talk about hockey. It's uh, it's exactly. what it's all about. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And of course, we can't go without the professor, Joe. How you doing, Joe? Awesome, awesome. It's always great to talk about hockey, and the weather's been pretty pleasant uh, up here of late on the East Coast. Obviously, by the beach in Cali, it's usually pretty <laughs> darn pleasant for Cali. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, here, it's been pretty pleasant of late. Um, <laughs> and I echo what you said. Thanks again, Delhi, for joining us. We always love uh, having you on, and I'm ready to definitely talk about the West Division. Is I pay attention to the three California teams for one side I do stuff for. And just this division is one of the more fun ones to watch in general to begin with. So definitely one of the most fun ones to pay attention to. Exactly. And I think this division here is probably potentially might have some of the most moves coming in and out of this division here as far as some of the teams that might be buyers and or sellers uh, at the trade deadline and or potentially beforehand. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do a round robin and I'm going to ask East of I'm going to ask each of our panelists what they think each team is going to do before the trade deadline or at the trade deadline uh, that's coming up here in just a couple of weeks. And we're talking about the Honda West Division. And we're going to start off with uh, with Anthony. And, and we're going to talk about the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. I know they don't go by Mighty Ducks. I know. I'm an old school. You see a lot of gray. Anaheim Ducks are third, play 33 games. They are 9, 18, and 6. They have 24 points. So give me a breakdown, uh, Deli, what you think about Anaheim and what they're – are they going to be buyers or sellers? What are they going to be doing here at the trade deadline? Absolutely. I definitely think they're going to be sellers. Uh, I mean, if you ask – Joe said the, the most fun division, not for Anaheim Ducks fans right now. The Ducks are really struggling, and, and fans are frustrated with the, with the GM situation and the coaching situation. So uh, I know everyone would like to see them be sellers. Uh, Bob Murray was uh, did an interview with Pierre Lebrun with The Athletic, kind of talking about how he's looking at this trade deadline, and he said he's open to anything. He's looking specifically more for an, almost NHL-ready players or NHL-ready players Young guys that fit in with their their growing young core, guys like Zegers, Drysdale, Steele, Jones, Terry. So uh, what people are are hoping for, at least in, in Anaheim fans, is maybe a trade of Ricard Raquel. The Maple Leafs have been rumored by Elliot Friedman to be looking for a guy like Raquel. He's cheaper. Uh, a team that's maybe more cash strapped can afford his his cap hit for just a couple of years, especially if the Ducks retain some salary. And looking back, the Ducks are probably going to want a guy like Robertson, uh, if you're talking about the Maple Leafs, someone who's young, who can fit in right away, like I said. Um, otherwise, maybe Ryan Miller. Uh, he's kind of partial to Southern California. Uh, if you read some articles about him, he doesn't really want to move. But I'll save that for actually a, another team that we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, Getzlav has been getting a little bit of talk just to, just in that LeBron article and, and on Twitter and stuff. I have a hard time believing he's going to go anywhere. Uh, I just, I don't see it. Um, he seems like he's really embedded here in Anaheim and likes it, and he's got a no-move clause. So uh, I think that's that's what you're probably going to see from Anaheim. Uh, but he did say, Murray did say that things are slow. Things have been slow on the on the phone, and, and he hasn't gotten a lot of calls yet. So maybe, uh, maybe things will pick up, but we'll see. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, that That's funny that... W- you mentioned some of the names that you did too, because we uh, we talked about a couple of the guys on on this team too that might be open, that might or potentially could be. You know what I mean? And and I'll let Professor Joe go next uh, and give me your breakdown here of the Anaheim Ducks and what you think uh, might they they might be doing here at the trade deadline. 
Well, I agree with what Delhi said. Obviously, um, yeah, it hasn't been the most uh, easy season I've watched other than like probably uh, like seven games, pretty much most of the Ducks games or watch the condensed games. So, yeah, it's hard to watch a lot of the defensive <laughs> and breakdowns and leaving Ryan Miller out to dry, especially uh, for some reason it's particularly worse when he's in net. I don't know why. Um, and then uh, when uh, Gibson's in that, all of a sudden the defense plays at least mediocre to not absolutely <laughs> pitiful. Um, so it's definitely a weird thing there. But I think they're definitely sellers. One guy that's interesting that Steele and I talked about in a video we did for uh, people that could be traded in the West um, is maybe just because similarly to how Ghost had those three great years and then tracked down a bit, that's kind of what Manson has done in his career. He's had those three great years and then tracked down a bit. Maybe if you want to move him for someone that you think you can start tracking upward again, that maybe is a couple years younger, that could be something I could potentially see them doing as another guy. Other than that, I think it's mostly the guys that Delhi threw. And I think if somebody would take Henrique, obviously he's been thrown on waivers already this year. So I think that's a guy if somebody said – we could use a third line center. We think we can get him to snap back into what he did last year on our club compared to what he what he what he's doing this year for the Ducks. Um, then maybe Henrique's an option, but you would have to want to uh, take him on until 2024, and the Ducks would probably have to eat some of that deal because he gets paid 5.825. I don't think a team would want to take that whole um, conglomerate of that contract on until 2024. Getzlaff, right. I'm entirely with Delhi. Getzlaff's a. I mean, I I think he should be retire with the Ducks and not leave. I think he likes it there. I don't think he's going to leave. Miller is probably something that, like, Delhi might lead into later. Seems like he's going to like Cowie, or there's going to be a new team in the future that's pretty darn close to California, oh. so we'll see. Uh, maybe uh, <laughs> something happens there. Right. Um, so I think those are really the guys that could yeah. get moved, because other than that, I don't think they're good. Unless if actually one other guy, I guess, to throw in, could be a Nicholas uh, Deloriers just because he's a tough guy that brings physicality. You need that for the playoffs. So some contenders, <clears throat> flyers, uh, might want to get a guy that brings physicality that is tough, right. that can hit people like Deloriers does. And actually this year has scored more than usual. He's got, he hasn't done it since the beginning of the season, but still even – him having right now six points, three goals, and three assists. The dude's only scored sometimes three points in a season, so he's still yeah. doing better yeah, than yeah, his yeah. scoring out. But he's a guy that'll fight anybody and stand up for his teammate. So sometimes those guys go underlooked and then become bigger pickups for playoff teams right. than you actually expect coming in as that physical spark. So I would say he would be the last guy. But other than that, I echo all of the people. Delhi said it would be Manson and mainly the Warriors and maybe Adam Henrique for me that I would think they might look to move. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I would have to agree with all those things. Uh, Perlo, uh, shed some wisdom here on, on what you feel uh, is going to be going on here with the uh, Ducks at the uh, trade deadline. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I speak to both of them pretty much uh, for sure. No doubt about it. They're going to be sellers. Uh, the difficulty is the contracts that they have for a lot of their players are very difficult to sell. Um, the one what they mentioned is Ra uh, Raquel. Raquel's reasonable. I think that they'll likely um, – it doesn't really make sense for them to keep Raquel at this point at 27 years old. Um, it really – I don't know what they're going to do, but from what I see from Anaheim, these there are a ways away. If um, I don't, maybe they have more knowledge of their prospect pool than I do. But from what I see from the prospect pool for Anaheim, they're pretty thin still. If you want to be a rebuilding team that is able to be competitive for a long time, I think they need a lot more building in their develop um, in their for their prospect pool before they can start even thinking about that. Um, so I don't know where management's at, but if it's me, yeah, like he. Um, Joe mentioned Josh Manson. Uh, yeah, Josh Manson would be on the block right now. And there's teams I think that would definitely take him and give up a first for him. I know he kind of been on the decline, but I think the perception would be mostly, look who he's playing for. You know, we'll put him in a situation where he has more around him and Josh Manson doesn't have to do everything and can be the defensive defenseman that he is. And I think 
he has a lot of value out there. So guys like him, Ricard Raquel for sure. Um, yeah, like I would, you'd love to see uh, you be able to get a pick. Maybe Kevin Shattenkirk. I thought they brought in Kevin Shattenkirk for the purpose of trading him. Yeah, I kind of had that feeling too. You know what I mean? He right. seems like he would be that one, that one piece that you could just move in and out of Anaheim, and it doesn't, it wouldn't really. It wouldn't really affect them as much as it would be if you move somebody else, I would think. And yeah. he he has not been good this year, unfortunately, for the Ducks. I mean, no. uh, <laughs> I talk about who he played with last year in Tampa, and you really then you start to see where he could benefit other teams. But if I could just add one last thing, if you want to see a, a kind of a perfect example of where the Ducks are right now, the guy you both mentioned, Adam Henrique, He's their leading, co-leading scorer, second leading scorer in the Ducks, and they've already put him on waivers. Just like... Wow. There's so many there's so yeah. many reasons that that is just a sad state of affairs. Yeah. And 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 I've mentioned this before um and I know it's it doesn't cut it it falls on very uh angry ears especially with uh Anaheim Ducks fans that uh listen to me and talk that I talk to but I think it's just an absolute shame that Gibson's going to be playing out his next yeah. 3 years on this team. I really think for the benefit of him for possibly the team, maybe, well, it's so hard to get rid of a guy like Gibson. Like, I, at times in his career, I think he was the best goaltender in the NHL. But I think, you know, give the guy a break. He's got, he, he's not going to come out and say it, but I, I really get the feeling that he would prefer to work. He's, he's in the prime of his career right now. Why would yeah. we want to be on this rebuilding team? Now, yeah. if Anaheim thinks that they're going to be a team in two years that can, then they're seeing something I don't, and you know who knows? Maybe they're right. But from what I see, I'd be looking at Gibson. Maybe not at this deadline, but somewhere down the road <clears> to <throat> just really uh, get something back for a guy who deserves to be playing for a good team at this stage of his career. Yeah, yeah, I agree with uh, Pirlo on that with Gibson. But when it comes to uh, as I wrap up point with the Ducks, Manson, I I agree with exactly what Pirlo said, and I'm sure Delhi would agree with it too. He just seems like a guy if he goes to a team that's deeper with what Pirlo said, he probably would start reverting back to what you saw when the Ducks were deeper from like the 15, 16 season through that three year stretch compared to this last three year stretch. So I feel like him and also Henrique, uh, who's usually much more efficient on both ends of the ice, um, is a guy that I think at the age of 31, if he goes elsewhere, probably would start doing what he used to do. The problem is I think that's an eated sum of the contract because he's at a five point something value. Mm -hmm. And he's 31 to 2024, his contract expired. So he'll be in his mid-30s by then. I think you're going to want cushion if you trade for him and not pay that entire salary. But if they're willing to eat a bit of that, I think he can rebound with a new club. And uh, so can uh, Manson. So it would be yeah. good for both of those guys and the Ducks to get more assets for them and let those guys compete elsewhere mm -hmm. at this point. I think what the uh, what the rules are is that if you trade a player, you according to the collective bargaining agreement, they the the trading teams have to split up the salaries to a certain percentage. That the trading the home team that's that's trading away the player has to pay a certain percentage of that player's salary that they're responsible for, as far as if they don't have an expiring contract, I believe. And then I also believe as well, too, is that now contracts are all prorated because you've paid almost half of the contract now already. So, yeah, well, that's OK. That's the season I'm talking about, like as future seasons go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, if yeah. you trade for Henrique, you're only going to you pay him less this season. But then in future seasons, if you took on his full value, right. you're right. paying him 5.8 right. uh, until 2024. Right. And Anaheim would only be on the hook for whatever the percentage was for this year only. Exactly. This right. year only. That's why right. I think you have to have them eat some of that contract. Yeah, well, they, sure. it, it's not that they're going to have to or that, that, that they want to or not. It's they're going to have to anyway. That's part of the I meant collective. Beyond this year. I meant beyond uh, this year. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Like, okay. Or like, so they don't pay them 5.8 each <laughs> Yeah, no. That's not how that works. <laughs> all right, well, I think we pretty much covered uh, what we all think the Anaheim uh, team is going to do this year. Uh, so let's move on to the San Jose Sharks. Uh, they've played 30 games. They're 12, 14, and 4 with 28 points. Uh, and we'll start off with uh, Perlo this time. And uh, 
Perlo, I'll tell you what, this has been kind of a tough team to kind of get a handle on. And I'll tell you what, I, I don't know. I, every time I pick them, they, they, they lose. Every time I don't pick them, they win. I don't know what to do. <laughs> anyway, so give me your uh, breakdown here, Perlo, on the San Jose Sharks. What do you think they're going to be doing here at the trade deadline? Well, geez, yeah, the, the, yeah, I, <laughs> you, you gave me the tough one right off the top. I'm trying oh, okay, to sorry. Up, I'm trying to pull up San Jose for some reason. It's not coming yeah, they up. They do have um, quite a bit of money. Yeah, they, well, they do have some cap room, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, they need to rebuild, but they can't. That's the biggest problem is they can't. There's, They'd have to trade Evander Kane. Uh, and they might find somebody that, you know, he's only 29 years old. He can still pot 30 goals. If, you know, maybe if there's a team out there that can take his whole contract that would give him a shot or at least bring something back in return. Uh, like, say, the New York Islanders could give up uh, a player in some picks to even it out so maybe they can eke underneath the cap somehow or something like that. But even if they do find a place for some guys that are tradable, like Hurdle, Thomas Hurdle, Kane, to pick up draft picks, you're still plastered with Eric Carlson, Brent Burns, uh, at eight, $11.5 million for eternity for Eric Carlson. <laughs> you, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that just goes like forever. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what do you do? How do you rebuild with that contract weighing on you? You try to do a rebuild, and Eric Carlson then, as you know, sharp as a freaking not the sharpest knife in the drawer, comes out in the public <laughs> and says, comes out in public and says, Well, you know, I didn't sign here to go on a rebuild. Well, fire your agent then, because you didn't have a very good idea. Your agent couldn't tell you that this roster was going to be rebuilding in two years. I mean, You'd sign the contract to get the eleven and a half million dollars. Oh, yeah, there you go. And exactly. Sit the, yeah. And sit in the sun in San Jose. That's what you did. So really, just keep your trap shut and let managers do what managers do. <laughs> you, you made you made your bed. Like so, yeah. what? This is the way it is, buddy. Uh, yeah, uh, that's it's it's a terrible situation. Edward Vlasic. Vlasic isn't is barely an NHL player really at this stage. He should be in uh, a six, seven spot, and he's making seven million dollars a year for an equal eternity. Uh, it's I don't know what to do with this. If you, you I, I, it's a, I'm a, a complete loss. Um, the best thing I can say is sell everything off, keep on getting draft picks, and sucking with Carlson, Burns, and Vlasic until they decide to retire. <laughs> that, that's my best thing here. Sell everything off and then make it so your team is so bad yeah. that Eric Carlson goes, yeah, okay, I, I'm out of here. But, you know, that's that's about all I got. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. Okay. I, I can't I can't say anything other than that. I mean, other, the only other thing you can do is hope that you can keep on adding yeah. as, the, as the cap goes up. Just keep on adding to this roster over and over again. And then maybe you make the playoffs and make your – owners a little bit of money somewhere along the way until yeah that's about the best that i don't think that's a very good option because it's going to keep you right in the middle you're not going to get high draft picks and you're just going to be hoping and praying and eric carlson brent burns are not getting better as their careers go on here right. so so yeah now i would say sell off evander sell off timu meyer sell off hurdle sell off everybody get first yeah, overall yeah. First round picks as many as you possibly can, and just wait for the old men to retire. Okay, that's so, that. I'd say. Okay, what, uh, what are they going to do? Oh gosh, I yeah, right. Wilson's right. got to be Wilson's going to be taking a lot of sleeping pills. I think that's what. They're <laughs> gonna do. Oh, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> well uh, s since uh, since we think uh, Delhi's going to have a bit of a different uh, opinion here on San Jose. Uh, why don't you uh, narrow us down here and give me some ideas about what you think San Jose is going to do this year? Um, I, yeah, G give us some insight, please. Well, I do agree with with uh, Perlo that that they're in definitely a tough spot. I mean, 
They have a little bit of cap space, not a lot. They've got these terrible contracts. I think their best case scenario looking into the future is maybe something like the Chicago Blackhawks, where they've got they've they've kind of dipped for a few seasons. They're not really competitive. The Blackhawks didn't have nearly as many terrible contracts as the Sharks have, but maybe you can you, you keep Meyer and Hurdle uh, if you want those two guys to provide some offense. Uh, maybe you get rid of Nieto and Sorensen. Maybe try a hockey trade where you can get get someone who's who's maybe down somewhere else for a similar value or a little maybe a little more, and hope that those guys thrive in Chicago. Because otherwise, Perlo's right. I mean, you've got those anchors dragging you down, those contracts, and you really, I mean, even if you sell off as much as you can, like Hurdle and Meyer, you're going to have these young guys, this massive gap in in talent and experience that you're is just going to, you're going to be pretty bad for, for the next few years. And also just hope that maybe you can draft some guys that can come in and, and really make a difference quickly. I mean, I gave the Chicago example, you've got Kirby doc who, who should be making a, an impact soon. And, uh, when I mentioned trades guys like Strom, so, and, and even Debrinkat, who they drafted, I think when they were still competitive, but you got to hope that you get lucky in the draft and that maybe you can switch around some pieces that, that are similar in cost, but maybe play better when they get to San Jose than they've been at their previous teams. That's my, <laughs> that's my best yeah, guess. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, that's, it does kind of, once it start once that ball starts to roll down the hill, it, it kind of just, I mean, you, it's hard to stop that ball rolling down the hill anymore. You know, and, and you're going to just have to wait till it crashes at the bottom before you kind of can do anything. So, Professor Joe, why don't you give me some insight here on to what you think the uh, Sharks are going to do this year? I think uh, pretty much what Pirlo and Dewey said, they got to try to bring in some picks. First of all, from a trade, they already don't have their second round pick uh, for this year's draft. So I think you're going to want to move somebody to, if you're not going to get another first for this year, at least have a second with how deep this draft also is. We have three deep drafts in a row last year's, this year's, and uh, the following year's. Uh, So I think you want to make sure you have a second round pick in this year's draft and are not missing one. Um, Another thing you can do, the only way you're going to get first is if you move, well, one, Evander Kane, obviously, if uh, somebody takes on him, somebody would probably give you a first, because the dude's almost a point per game still. He's at 27 points in 30 games. So I think somebody would be willing to give you a first for that. Um, I think if you're the Sharks, I'm kind of with Delhi. You might want to keep like the Hurdles and the Myers of the world, just because Myers only 24, Hurdles 27. You can still have them for a couple more years. Couture is a fan favorite, but Couture is not getting any younger. So if somebody would take Logan Couture as a center for their team, I think you would be better off moving him and Kane because you're getting rid of two guys, one that's about to hit his 30s, one that's already in his 30s in Logan Couture that I think just makes more sense logistically to me. And then you still have some offense via Tomas Hurdle, Timu Meyer, And honestly, Marlowe's still pretty damn good on offense for being 40-something years old and played in the league for over 20 years now. Uh, he only has five points, but he sets guys up more than you would think watching the Sharks this year. And they just miss the net or what have you to not allow him to have a little bit more than he had when he played down lines with uh, – some of the guys like Curtis Gabriel who will fight any of them or John Leonard who's still figuring out it out. But I'm with them. You got to bring more picks into house in San Jose. You got to bring more picks into the shark tank. You got to make smart waiver claims like you had to and uh, pick up some undrafted guys like the Kali Kuzinov to my, to me, other than Mario Ferraro, who's by far hands down been their best defenseman. Kuzinov arguably has been their second most consistent defenseman. who's an undrafted rookie. That's why I've been making the joke with the Sharks whenever I talk about them. You got two rookies looking around having the old Vince Lombardi quote. Uh, like, what the hell's going on out here? Like, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, when you have them playing <laughs> the best defense and you have all these veterans and Burns, Vlasic, and Carlson, and they look like they have no idea where they're supposed to be. And you have two rookies going, go over there. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Shouldn't the veteran be telling the rookie where to yeah, go? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so their defense has been his second to is much frustrating the ducks has obviously been as a minus 40 the most frustrating the sharks i believe are like a minus 19 or something like that they've been the second most frustrating because they just have not been together other than the two rookies so i think you have to be sellers bringing some draft picks you got to continue rudolph boucher's uh has been fit 
uh, actually pretty fondly impressive coming over uh, on waivers for the Sharks is a kind of Tyler Pitlick-esque uh, energizer player. Mm-hmm. So if you can make those waiver claims, get John Leonard, as you got, who looks really good when he's with the Barracuda and has shown some signs with the Sharks. If you keep making those picks later in the rounds, picking some undrafted guys, making good waiver claims, and getting draft picks like Delhi, uh Pirlo, and I said, I think you could get this going in the right direction, how Delhi pointed out, like it only took Chicago about two years to now be competing again this mm-hmm. year. So you have to be smart about it, though. You have to trade the right people Garner the right draft picks and make sure you hit in the draft too. That's the biggest key. You obviously can't be the Philadelphia Eagles of hockey and just stink at drafting. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Um, San Jose. Yeah. They are very much in a tough spot. It's when you have those kinds of large contracts like that, and then they have a lot of guys that they are going to need to be putting back on the team next year as well, too. And so they do have some money, but they need guys to be re-signed. And they're not going to be able to re-sign some of these guys because of these ugly contracts that they have. So they're going to have to move somebody to get some picks so they can stockpile on the picks and go from there and try to move some of these big, ugly contracts so that gives them a little bit more money to pay some of the younger guys to continue to stay and continue to develop and things like that so that they can continue to be like – what Chicago is doing in their rebuild. Cause that's kind of what they did. You know what I mean? They're like, Oh yeah, we're doing a rebuild. But, but if you look at Chicago's record right now, it's like, wow, if that's a rebuild. I, okay. <laughs> if I could just continue a little bit with Chicago, they were doing the rebuild before they said they were oh, doing right. the rebuild. Right? Oh, right. San Jose has not been doing that. They should have been doing that. That's yeah. the difference. Now, what I would do here is I would trade these guys I'm saying and I would bring in people that you want to define your organization around. So they can be more veteran players, but they're players like, this is the way we want to play. So as you draft people and they come up, you can say, watch these guys. Yeah, they may not be the most skilled guys in the world, and we're not winning lots, but these guys know what it means to be a winner. So draft those guys in there. Yeah. If you can't get rid of Carlson's contract and whatever, let them stick around, whatever you want to do. But this is the direction we're going. That's what I'm here. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think we pretty much uh, closed that Shark Tank pretty well, and uh, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna jump from from one animal to another. We're gonna jump into the Yotes. That'd be the Arizona Coyotes. Uh, they played 32 games so far. They are 13, 14, and five with 31 points. Uh, this is uh, Rick Tockett's uh, expiring contract year. Um, so, and Arizona has some of the potentially juiciest uh, players on the block, I guess you could call it that. So uh, we'll start with uh, Professor Joe. And Joe, give me a breakdown here on the Arizona Coyotes and what you think they're going to be doing here at the trade deadline. I think they're going to be uh, more of um, sellers. Now, some of the guys they're trading for, they might be able to get other assets back that they might be able to turn around and maybe make into something like another like defenseman for defenseman or something like that that's a little bit younger but has been inconsistent maybe in the last two years of his career that the Coyotes think they can make more consistent, something along that elk. Um, But I think with them at 31 points at a minus 19 differential, their defense has been inconsistent uh, from their forwards to their defensive quarter. They're going to be looking to move people more – where I think the guys, obviously, they're going to be looking to move. Uh, and they have to bring in draft picks, too. Just like the uh, Sharks, they don't have, though, a first and a third. So I think if you're if you're the Coyotes, you want to, obviously, you're probably going to be over-asking on a guy like uh, Jomerson to start just because you don't have a first. I think with him on an expiring contract, you're probably more likely to get a, a um, second-round pick than a first-round pick or a third, maybe, yeah. if uh, – you can't settle for that just because usually for expiring, you better be darn sure you're resigning that guy as a team if you're going to trade a first for an expiring contract. Um, obviously, Goligoski is another veteran. I think they'll probably look to move him. And then um, I think they're obviously look to move uh, Jason Demers as well when it comes to the defense, when it comes to being um, sellers. A guy that will be interesting just because he still scores and if he uh, – actually would agree to be moved would be if a team that can afford him wants Phil Kessel just because he does still score. Um, And if you're a team that's really 
lacking scoring, but that's in the race right now. Maybe uh, you would want to bring in someone like Phil Kessel. That's a veteran. That's won with teams in the past. Uh, that can put the puck in the net. Hell, if you're Chicago, maybe you would even want to do that because you're lacking scoring depth throughout your lineup and you're contending as a, like Steele said, so-called rebuilding team. Yeah, yeah, so, right. <laughs> um, that's a team that's an example there that lacks scoring depth that's uh, doing well. So um, I think they're a team that's definitely looking to sell. I think if you can try to bring in a first, but I think for them, in order to do that, uh, you're going to have to, at that point, um, put trade and hope he's back by the deadline. I know he's weak to weak Kemper, but if he's back, I feel like he's the most likely guy as a goaltender to maybe get a first from, potentially maybe Ronta with how well he's playing. But I just feel like mm-hmm. out of guys they can trade, Kemper's probably your most likely guy to get a first. So. Yeah. It's going to be hard to do that, but you can definitely get a crap ton of picks. If you trade Geligoski, Demirs, and Jomerson, you probably just get seconds, thirds, and fourths, and fifths, respectively, somewhere in those round uh, lengths rather than a first because they're all on expiring deals. I think it would take Kemper, honestly, if healthy, before April 12th and fully back to doing his thing uh, to potentially get a first. Okay. Okay. So you think they're going to be uh, potentially sellers here to try to get draft picks or assets uh, yeah. yeah assets or whatever uh all right deli uh break it down for me here buddy what what do you think about what they're going to do out here in the desert i think there's a difference between what they want to do and what they can do obviously we'll, we'll talk about it more with the competitive teams but with the flat cap there aren't a lot of teams that are going to be able to afford to bring in a, a player with a large contract but if you think about what was going on off the ice with the Arizona Coyotes and their franchise, the articles that came out about all the dysfunction, about how their owner tends to run the team more as he would in a different industry where he kind of wants to get everything cheaper and take profits out of that. Yeah. So does he want to trade big contracts, maybe like Oliver ekman Larson? I mean, the rumors were there this summer, but I don't. If he, I think he wants to, but I don't know if he can with the other teams not being able to afford to take on a contract like that. I mean, you heard the Bruins were interested in him over the summer. So that's what I think they want to do. What I think they can do is probably someone like Broussard. He's been all over the place, but he's a guy who can fill in with a cheaper contract. Teams can afford, who can maybe be the third-line guy, provide some depth. Uh, stinks for him because he's been all over the place, but uh, he's he's a name I definitely think. Uh, could go Kessel. I agree with you, Joe. I think he he would be attractive to a lot of other teams, but I mean, who can really afford him at this point? Uh, he yeah. seems like a guy who who might be stuck there. Uh, so that that's my that's my two cents for the Coyotes uh, in a tough spot, also. But I think it more for off the ice problems than on. And obviously, with their draft picks, they had to renounce their rights to uh, to the guy who was embroiled in that that controversy over the summer. Uh, and they had their two picks at least stripped from them. So yep. I think they're going to want draft picks. They need draft picks for their organization. Um, so that's really that's where I'm thinking they're going to go. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like I that's like that why idea. It would be- that's yeah, why I was ahead. going to say it would be interesting if they would trade. It seemed like they would be more leaning to trade Ronta as their goalie to keep Kemper to try to have the guy that's kind of um, to build around more where Ronta is doing really well, but has been – Kemper's, of course, injured now, but Ronta's been the guy that's been banged up more in his career, unfortunately, for him. Uh, but now that might be flipped uh, now that I think about it more in depth, like I said, just because if you want to get your first back – unless if you're a team that really needs goaltending, I'm not sure if just for this potential year of anti-Ranta and no guarantee signing back with you, uh, you're going to give up a, a first-round pick. So. Yeah. All right, Perlo. Uh, lay some wisdom on me here. Uh, what do you think about these Yotes? You think they're going to be uh, selling, buying? What do you think they're going to do? Oh, they're for sure going to be selling. There's no doubt about that. Uh, like uh, Delhi said, this how much are they going to be able to sell? Um, one no, uh, note is they're not just a rumor; it's actually words that Connor Garland is available for the right price from the man, from from Armstrong. Uh, Connor Garland's a good young player who's up for a restricted free agency here. Now, I really don't think that they're wanting to trade Connor Garland. 
What they're wanting to do is get people to talk to them about trades. They're trying, because if you put a Connor Garland out there, the phone's going to start ringing. People want Connor Garland. Okay? Yeah, they're right? seeding the water. He's their <laughs> prize piece right now. He doesn't make much this year. You have more cost certainty down the road. They can talk to their agent. They can work out a deal, all that kind of stuff like that, right? So, yeah, yeah, come on. Call me about Connor Garland. Oh, yeah, actually, no, that's not enough. But I have blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like the car salesman. Uh, here's a great oh, deal yeah, on a car, but there's only one in the <laughs> lot, right? <laughs> but when you come in, but when you come in, now we can start talking about, hey, what about Connor Garland and this guy for this guy? So you can start bringing up other names that you want to trade. Connor Garland doesn't work out, but it turns out they do want Nicholas Jalmerson after all. So you can get a pick for him. He's got a no movement clause, by the way. Yeah. That's the problem. If he decides he wants to stay in in Arizona, and I have no idea why he would want to do such a thing, but it could be family, uh, then we can't move him. But I think they're looking. I think they will find a pers- place for Goligoski, Jalmerson, and uh, um, they could probably for Jordan Osterle too. I would. There's a really good little pickup for somebody there, Jordan Oster- Osterley, uh, for a player team out there. Probably could get him for a third or fourth. And they're just going to pick up as many seconds as they can, thirds, fourths. And then those guys were going to be free agents anyways. In the offseason, they're going to do, I believe, what they did last offseason. And kind of what I was saying with San Jose, Armstrong did here. They picked up guys that they want to identify their organization with, Tyler yeah. Pitt. Tyler Pitlick. Yeah. That's a guy you want to ad- identify your organization with, right? Yeah. We, we we know how much we love him. Guys like that. Derek Broussard, for sure. Somebody will, somebody will pick him up, but you're only getting a fifth or sixth. But they'll do all that, and then they'll try to find some people to replace those guys the next year. As far as Kemper is concerned, I would really love for Kemper to, to go somewhere else, so he has an opportunity. But I think this team can't afford to lose a goaltender like that until they have one in their system that they think is going to be somebody like that. Cause this team, I don't think the bad part about Arizona is they, they can't really afford to go in and ne- like on a uh, rebuild for the next eight years or there's no organization. Yeah. That's really the hardest part for Arizona. Yeah. And, and yeah. with them, with them being strapped with uh, the things that they've done off the ice, you know what I mean? I, I too agree. I, I think they're going to be trying to get as many picks as they can. And you know what? You know what might end up happening if they can't? Because I agree. I don't think even Yalmerson or Golagoski, the only person I would think that would be remotely worthy of a number one would be Ekman Larson. I mean, mm-hmm. he would really or 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 the the goaltender. Other yeah, than that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, there's really nobody on this team that's going to garner you a first round draft pick. Yeah, so and Larson's you, contract won't get you first that, either. That's what I mean. And, and you're not going to be able to ask that of somebody and say, oh, by the way, we need a first-round draft pick because <laughs> you ain't going to get that. Nobody's no. going to take that from you. You know what I'm now, saying? Now, Connor Garland, if you do trade a might. Yeah, Connor Garland would. Oh, okay, but it's a might. It, it's not, you know, like you could pretty much guarantee if you if you got Ekman Larson on your team, you, you the first-round draft pick, okay. Yeah, I would uh, you, say uh, a team would be much more easily, readily available to give up that pick yeah. for that level of player than they would be for somebody else. Is all I'm trying to say. For Connor Garland, they're going to want two firsts, and, <laughs> well, uh, and probably okay. nobody, and probably nobody's going to give them that. Okay, I yeah, they're probably think, over but, ass. You know, Yeah, you're want. probably right. They probably would over ass because of what you said. They're probably just trying to put out feelers so they get calls more than actually. Yeah, man, they're chumming the waters, dude. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, as a closing point with the Coyotes, their goaltending, if they really do need a first, um, I think um, if you trade and you're kind of in this retooling period, I think Ronta's played a little bit better than the stats speak. If you look at some of his inner numbers, he still has a 913 save, but all those goals against the save, his team stats, his teams let him down sometime. I think he's been good. Ronta, or excuse me, Aiden Hill's also been pretty good. Uh, if you're retooling anyway, 
I don't think you necessarily need Darcy Kemp, but you're better off having draft picks to bring in more assets because his contract expires in, after next season anyway. I don't think he has much incentive to want to stay in Arizona. So you might as well get something for him when you have more value because he has a year and a half left rather than just the final year of his contract. That's the other side I'm looking right. at. It. And you know what else might happen here, too, is you might see this team do more stuff in the offseason than you will during by the trade deadline. That that might yes, be something. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's not a good it's idea. But that's for another show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I so, just think that's not a good idea for Kemper just because he has yeah, a yeah. year left. Yeah. You get more value for this now, yeah, now. Yeah, gotcha. plus for all of next season. So, yeah. All right, so now we're going to move into uh, another California team here. And uh, we're, we're, we got California Dream and Delhi here with us. And he's going to break down the Los Angeles Kings and what he thinks that uh, this team is going to do. They played 31 games. They're 13, 12, and 6 with 32 points. Uh, break it down for us, man. Yeah, I think the Kings are maybe my most interesting team on the, uh, during the trade deadline. If you think about where their organization is in terms of the salary cap, they have tons of cap space. I mean, they've got right now deadline cap space, 41 million, projected cap space <laughs> just under 10, like 9.2. And they're competitive. They're actually, yeah. I mean, they're not really that close, but they've got a 500 record. They, their, their point percentage is good. Uh, they're relatively speaking on the up and up. And in an area and a time in their franchise where you're maybe not expecting it so much, they're kind of playing with house money. So this is the one team I think could make a really significant move because they're not in an urgent situation where they're like, we have to make the playoffs this year. We're, we're looking to be more competitive next year. This is a team, if Arizona that was willing to trade uh, a guy like Garland or, or, or even uh, OEL oh, yeah. within the division, that could afford it. Same thing with a guy like Eichel. I mean, the Kings are are really in the best position, I think, that they could be in the league. And the last thing, and this is kind of my, uh, a little bit of a fantasy uh, trade scenario that I've been playing with in my head. Uh, so Lisa Dillman of The Athletic mentioned Jonathan Quick as maybe the most likely King to be traded. So okay. bear with me here. No, let's, no, say, no. let's say the Kings trade Quick. Uh, Ryan Miller on the Ducks, the backup goalie, has said he doesn't want to leave his family. He moved from the Hollywood area down to Manhattan Beach with his family, so it would be an easier commute to Anaheim. But Manhattan Beach is also minutes from the Kings practice rink and much closer to Staples Center than it is to Honda Center. And there is no, I don't think there's a quarantine that has to be done when you literally just drive from your house to another arena. So there's no, <laughs> so there's no like delay that's going to take him to get there. So I, I think what happens, or I don't think what happens, but what I would love to see happen, the Kings trade quick. Uh, the Ducks trade Miller to the Kings for like a late round draft pick. Miller gets to come back up for a semi-competitive team for the last maybe couple weeks of the season yeah and and best of all the ducks can call up lucas dostal to back up uh john gibson for the final stretch of the season you get to see what dostal has and maybe in the off season if you like what you see uh you can send he or gibson away for for something else so uh that's that's really what i'm what i'm hoping happens but you never know wow that's uh wasn't even i mean we kind of talked about if if any of the people in here would be somebody that would go, that it might be quick, but wasn't real. That's I really like that scenario, man. I think that that makes a lot of sense too, when you look at what's going on with this team and where they're at. You know, because they're only five points out of a, a, a playoff position right now. You know what I mean? And we all know that that's three games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Seriously, and each game now is four point swing where every game now means twice as much as what it did before. So three games, you're right back in it. And L.A. has been competitive. So let's go to uh, Perlo. And Perlo, what do you think about what's going on here with uh, the Kings and what do you think they're going to do during the trade deadline? Yeah, um, Rob Blake uh, has already come out and said that the rebuild is over. So... Um, and they're so close right now. I think they're going to be tentative buyers. Some, That's uh, a good word to use. Yeah, yeah. I, I would. Say they're going to be tentative buyers because um, they still have players that are working their way up the lineup, and I don't think they want to like crush their spirit by bringing in too, a player that's going to take a spot from them um, in too many ways. However, 
uh, at the same note, if they could bring in a character person who can help them win now and help those kids become, you know, greater at the same time, I think they're interested in somebody like that. Uh, that, that, that would be kind of where I was. At. I don't think they're going to go off the chain anywhere. Um, but like a good example would be they have a very young defense. Um, Dowdy is really uh, doing a lot there for Anderson, Bjorn, for Roy, who they just signed, uh, McDermott, Walker. They're all 26 or under, right? So mm -hmm. some better, another veteran defenseman to help Dowdy with Good those point. kids, uh, to push those kids along and basically be able to say as well that, um, you know, I, I trying to think of a name off the top of my head. Maybe one of you guys will come up with somebody like that, but that can play too. That can play in the four or five spot if given the opportunity to do so, to push these guys and help them become better as players and also be depth. If LA, and it's possible with the way Cal Peterson is playing, can uh, make it to a, to a spot to have an opportunity because you never know, you know, the old adage, once you make it, you never know what can happen once yeah. you get into the, once you get in there. So exactly. it's, the, I think they're in that kind of a spot. However, I don't think they're going to sell the farm and start throwing first around to, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to build up like a sec to get a second line center. Um, when, a when they have Adrian Kempe, who is growing now, you're starting to see a lot of improvement in this game. I think they'd rather see that, not to mention Jared Dolan Anderson, who I've been talking about for a while, and now we're starting to see the fruit of that now. Yep. So I don't think they're going to be adding in those places in that way where it's a big move. But, yeah, some character guys that have playoff experience especially. Stanley Cup's even better. We yeah. talk about Jalmerson, you know, a guy like that. That would be... Yeah. Somebody like that yeah, uh, for the back really end good. or yeah. cup three cups into a room of team that doesn't have a lot of cups. Uh, they do have some. Kopitar's got cups. Brown has cups. Don't get me wrong. But you never right. can have enough. Yeah. You can never have a Dowie has That'd cups, but you can never have enough of those. Water. I think that would be basically where they're going. Otherwise, I think they pretty much stand pat. Uh, okay. I, I'm quick. Uh, they, they talk about quick as well. Although, I don't know. I think the quick talk, I, I'm not sure about that because uh, uh, we, again, if they're going to make it, having quick there if Peterson fails and helping Peterson through everything where they always already have a relationship with each other, I think it's a little too valuable to be just for what anybody's going to give for him. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, Professor Joe, uh, what do you think about the LA Kings? I know this is one of the teams that you kind of, uh, you know, contribute for and stuff like that. So what do you think about what the Kings are going to do this year? Um, I think they didn't expect to have it to announce or have to be in the happy place of announcing that the rebuild is kind of over like Rob Blake did, like Pierlo said, as quickly. I think this moved a little bit quicker than like they don't even have. I think they would have expected to have to have the Velardis of the world, yeah. uh, have to have... Um, the uh, byfields of the world, the Turcots of the world, everybody up, and then they would be like, okay, now we're really hitting it. But they did it with picking up a lot of smart moves, which was getting a guy like Trevor Moore, who now since coming to the Kings has become that great energizer third-line player that has contributed in the team's points. McClellan loves uh, how Carl Grundstrom has finally started, uh, now at the age of 23, kind of using his body for positional play a lot more smartly uh, than he did when he was over in the um, Toronto organization. So I think um, having that, Ante Tecio is somebody, um, he's somebody that will be interesting to see. Because he's played well for the Kings, but of course they just signed him for one year. And I always thought they got him primarily to try to get more pick assets for. But the Kings are also a team. Uh, they could, like uh, Pirlo uh, was saying, just pick up a defenseman or something and then kind of stay where they're at. Because this team already has enough picks for at least next year. They have two seconds, two thirds, and yeah. two fourths. So it's not like they have any push like the other teams we talked about to actually acquire more draft picks for at least next season so they don't have to trade some guys but if you want to it would be interesting to see maybe onto to CEO, 
you would move, um, depending if you think Blake Lazard, I would think he's a guy that's going to become an odd man out, but is a pretty solid, a uh, small guy, only five, seven, but a scrappy energizer, uh, bottom two line player that I think will be an odd man out when their other centers come up. So right. maybe try to move him now with, since he's becoming a restricted after this year, see what you can get for him. Uh, you have a lot of young guys coming up. So I think the guys that are going to become pushed out by them, you might want to see if you can move them. But that's only going to be like, I think, the Lazats of the world. And maybe if you want to see if somebody gives you a good trade for Ante Desio, you would move him. But I think you only move Ante Desio because he's been in their top six and a big part of their team this year. If you get a deal that's a little bit surprising to you where you got more than you thought would be offered to you. Where Lazats a guy, somebody could come up now and kind of fill in at the uh, fourth line center role, or you could just put Michael Amadio back at playing fourth line center like he has before, or Kupari or something like that, and then have Anderson Dolan, who's played on the fourth line, play there. You can move people around. There's uh, They have options with centers. That's why okay. he would be the one guy center. Otherwise, I think Goligoski is a guy to look out for, for the Kings, just because he has that cup with Pittsburgh in 09, yeah. is a veteran presence that's almost like the Niskanen, guy that can just come in you just expect good play from him and then maybe you get more than you expect from him like the flyers did from niskin so i think he's a guy to look out for he's going to be pretty easy to get on the cheap from arizona probably the cheapest guy potentially uh out of the guys that they might move so i think getting him would be smart for the king right they have a lot of space they have a lot of space as far as cap and they have a lot of picks but uh, I do like some of the things that you guys were talking about. I, I do like the idea of Yalmerson or somebody like that going there. Deli, what did you have to say? Yeah, I just have, I want to add a, a final thoughts on the Kings. One thing we, we none of us have mentioned, I don't think, is that they maybe have a little bit of a built-in ad soon with Byfield. They haven't brought up Byfield from Ontario. And, I mean, if you get if you move him up and he makes an impact, that is kind of like a deadline trade right there. Um but one of the other things that I, I run of the reason I think they might be more inclined to make a big move is, is people kind of made this comparison with the Patriots in football and free agency that they happen to have a lot of cap space when their other teams didn't. And when, when the pandemic was really affecting the other teams, in the NFL, it's kind of the same thing on the trade deadline with the Kings so far, they have a lot of cap space. They're not in an urgent situation and a lot of other teams don't. And that's, if you hear what people are writing about kind of suppressing the trade deadline right now. So if a team gets desperate, a seller gets desperate, they do have the Kings to look at and the Kings and just say, Hey, I know you guys aren't getting significant offers for these players because people can't afford it. So just take what we have to give you. We have some good stuff. Take what we have to give you and, <laughs> and, good, and we'll take them off it. your hands. I so like that. That's, the, that's where I think they could use it to their advantage. There you go. Yeah, they're that's kind of walking true. around. They're walking around like the big man on the block, man. They got the big wad of cash. They got a whole boatload of picks, and they don't need anything. They got a guy. They got people they can bring up within their system yeah. and organization already. You know what I mean? Yeah. I agree that's with Dewey on that. Thing. I don't think they need much forwards and defense. Sean Dursey, who they also got in a deal with Toronto, almost is ready too. It seems like uh, in the minors, uh, watching him for another team that's pretty tough to watch when it comes to the AHL level, Ontario. But I uh, have some fun players to watch. But as a whole, I haven't been putting it together great. But Kali of Kupari Byfield, and also. Uh, for Gamo uh, in the uh, minors uh, are all seem, Akil Thomas even seems to progressing quicker than I think they expected. So they got a lot of guys coming quickly. I think defense is really where they're primarily going to look, but because of exactly what Dewey just mentioned, you have guys coming quickly. Yeah. I think that might be why a guy like Lazat will look to get maybe a fourth or fifth round pick from a energizer bottom two line player that somebody might want just to kind of show people, look, this is the energy we need you to play yeah. with each. Give me this 115. Right. Like he's like the upshaw of the Kings kind of, he just brings that energizer every night. He's never going to do anything sexy for you, but he just does that for you. That's why I think uh, he could be someone they look to move, but I like this team moving forward. I don't think they have to do much. The only one guy I think we left. Some more. 
Yeah, they have to win a little bit, but I think they got screwed by the fact that Walker only played 22 games, 26 for Roy this far. The week they were out and some change for Walker really was when the Kings yeah. started losing a bit, and since coming back in, they stabilized again. So I think when everyone's in defensively, uh, they've really played well. Uh, Bjornford, I think, would probably be the odd man out just because he still has shown some rawness if you bring in a veteran. And then you would be able to kind of have him develop a little bit more if you want to give him a little bit more time down in Ontario. So that would be what I think they're kind of looking to do there. Ali Mata, if he can come back healthy, um, maybe would be a guy you look to move because he yeah. has he's been disappointing, just like Shattenkirk. Uh, <laughs> disappointing uh, for the Ducks has been what Ali Mata was for the Kings after picking him up. So, all right. Well, we're going to move on to the uh, St. Louis Blues. Um, this is the defending Stanley Cup champions from two years ago. Uh, they're in fourth place. They played 32 games. They have a record of 16, 11, and 5 for 37 points uh, currently right now. And we're going to start off with uh, the great Pearl of Wisdom. And uh, give me your assessment here on what St. Louis you think is going to do here at the trade deadline. Um, it's so difficult to say because they've been so injured. I don't think they know what their team is yet. That's a good uh, point. that's that you, you don't have Col, Col, uh you don't have Pareko for almost the whole year. I mean that was the guy that you that they were relying on when they let Peter Angelo go pretty much. You know, they figure well, okay, we have Pareko here so we can lean on him and uh, they haven't had him almost all year. Um they just signed Binnington to a long-term contract and um I think that they're almost to the point now where, like, we can hope we hope we make it in <laughs> and just go from there and kind of forget this season happened. Or uh, maybe we do something. Maybe we do something when uh, the off when uh, the playoffs come, when we have these players come into our lineup. To me, it doesn't make much sense to add or whatever when you don't know what you are here. So yeah, I don't yeah. see them buying all that much. I find it hard to think that they would be buying much. Here, maybe as players come back, it gave them an opportunity to see what they had with their replacements. Yeah. And maybe some of those replacement players get traded somewhere for draft Could picks and stuff yeah. like that. Um, St. Louis is not afraid if they don't think they're there. If they don't think for whatever reason they're there to win a cup, like they did with Stempniak in the past, or uh, not Stempniak, uh, Shattenkirk, uh, just before uh, at the trade deadline, before they were going into the playoffs, where they were pretty much in a just barely in a playoff spot, they traded him, and at the time he was their one of their best defensemen. So they're not afraid. Like for instance, if Mike Hoffman, they don't think he's working out because he hasn't really gelled with too many people. He may, they may say, hey, we're going to send you off somewhere else. We just don't think you're working out. We got Sunquist coming back and all of that. We'll roll with them, and they'll take the draft pick for them. They're not afraid to do that sort of thing. Earlier in the season, Vince Dunn was told that he was pretty much on the trade block. Like, they were not happy with him for uh, whatever reason. They don't think he's progressing. I think it was a kick-in-the-pants type move by them more than actually wanting yeah. to trade him. But if they still feel that way, there's a guy right now you could get. Uh, they could get a lot of value for. Uh, at 24 years old, he's not making much. He's a restricted free agent at the end of the year. But uh, there was teams interested. I heard Pittsburgh. There was a big rumor about that. Pittsburgh was really interested. And, you know, if they don't think they're going to be in a cup contending place right now, they're not afraid to make a move like that because right. St. Louis's mantra – has basically been stay relevant. And they are not afraid to let Peter Angelo go because they don't want to give too much of their cap space to one one player. They want to make sure they're deep and uh, always in that playoff contention every year. So they're going to make moves that don't make sense to the players in the room quite often, which they've done. And yeah. I could see them doing something like that here. Okay, cool. Uh, Professor Joe, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about St. Louis? Uh, they, they, they're not that far. I mean, they're in playoff contention right now. You know what I mean? So what, what do you think about what uh, the Blues are going to do? Yeah, this is a tough team to peg because, like Pirlo said, they haven't been uh, fully healthy. They, of course, uh, now have uh, Vladdy uh, back. Um, 
which has five points in eight games. So that just goes to show how he can perform offensively, defensively. He obviously needs to get those legs back, but that's how hockey players already get the offense back first. Usually defense comes a little bit slower, especially when you're a primarily offensive, uh, touted guy. Uh, but I think they're a team that's more likely to stay pat than any of the teams we talked about, just because, like Pirlo said, they're still trying to figure out their own identity. But if they're trying to be a combination of buyers and sellers, what they could do is uh, let Vili Huso kind of fix his quirks that he has. Because in a couple of recent games I've watched, he's looked a bit better, but I think it would still behoove them to maybe bring in another netminder and allow Billy Huso to kind of work on things in practice or uh, down in the minors to just kind of tighten some things up. You can do that. If you're trying to do a combination of buying and selling, I think there's teams that would be interested in how he's played this year and has winning experience, like you and me said yesterday. Uh, Steele back with Pittsburgh. Uh, might be if you get him for a middle, like a fifth or sixth round pick, if they want to trade a guy like Bertuzzo, he has a lot of playoff yeah. experience with the yeah. Blues and with Pittsburgh. That could be a guy you get a late round pick for. Same with Kyle Clifford. If you want to move guys like that, you could get a late round pick for him. Because uh, the Blues are in a very weird spot uh, because they're at a minus seven goal differential where the Kings, I think, have been when healthy, more consistent on both ends. But again, it's hard to peg who I yeah. think is better to ascend because Bennington has been started great and now in the last week has had some inconsistent play. And then Billy Huso obviously just doesn't seem like he's fully ready for the NHL gotcha. yet. And that's more of a goaltender room thing where him and Bennington are boys. So they kind of like that chemistry more than I think his goalie being fully ready. So I, I, I would say if they're smart, they should kind of combine staying pat and moving on just from like maybe the Bertuzzos and the Cliffords just to uh, when you have Suncris come back, you can kind of slot him in and then you can still keep a guy like Mike Hoffman who hasn't been as good as they expect, but 20 points in 31 games is still not bad in my opinion. I thought he's been solid. And then a guy like uh, Barbashev, uh, who also wasn't performing bad, if he comes back this year, you have options if you get rid of guys like uh, Clifford um, to be able to kind of let those guys just flow into the lineup more smoothly. And then with Robert Bertuzzo, you could just put in like Nico McCola or like somebody else, so Steven Santini, who has some experience until Paranko comes back. Right. So I think those are guys you might be able to uh, move just because you're getting middle round picks. Other than that, I would stay packed because you already have dra- uh, right. you already have drafted fairly well and have a pretty good setup team to stay in contention. You have Clint Costin and others yeah. that'll be coming up uh, in the near future. So. Awesome, yeah, man. All right, uh, Dally, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about the Blues here, man? I'd be shocked if they do anything. Uh, they they have like like Perlo said a lot of injury problems, a lot of guys coming back. They're recent Stanley Cup champions, so I, I don't think there's a lot of pressure amongst the fan base and in the front office. So I really think they just see what they've got this season. They've got a few guys with pretty big contracts coming up in free agency uh, that they can either let go or resign. That will give them a little more flexibility to to address those needs uh, in the off season rather than at the trade deadline where the price might be actual talent rather than just free agent money. So I think they stand pat. I, I don't see them going after anyone, especially cause in the, in the West division, it's like they're, they're pretty well set up They're They're towards kind of flirting with that line, but really you only have the Kings to battle with the sharks and ducks and coyotes are not going to give you a fight. Uh, and I, th- I still think the, the blues have a superior lineup to the Kings. So I don't think they do anything. I'm going to have to agree with just about everybody here. The, the, the one thing that I would think of is this. Um, they, they could try to move some of the lower end fellows like, uh, like Joe was talking about because they are going to get some of their guys coming back. You know, and when you get guys back from injured reserve, I know it takes a couple games for them to get back, you know, get their skating legs and everything. But that's almost like getting a trade deadline deal right there, too, especially when you have guys that have been out for such a, 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 a period of time where they – get to come back and start to contribute. I agree. I don't, I, what, what the only thing you could move is just try to move some depth around, try to, you know, maybe get a draft pick. Cause they don't, I don't think they currently have a second round. They don't, and they don't have a fourth round pick. 
So they might try to move somebody, but for the most part, yeah, I, I think they're just going to be moving depth around anyway. So, all right. Well, that, that brings us to the Minnesota Wild. And I believe I said that correctly with the correct yeah. accent. Minnesota. They played 30 games. They are 19, 10, and 1 with 39 points. Uh, and I don't think any of us, uh, well, any of us as far as Joe and Perlo and myself, really thought Minnesota was going to be anywhere sniffing close to this part of the of the lot of the uh, division so uh, we'll, we'll start off with Joe on this one here and Joe what do you think about uh, the Minnesota wild trade deadline here well I don't think Minnesota looking at their draft capital and trades they made in recent history they stocked up on two first round picks so I think coming into this year they thought yeah we're going to get into contention maybe be a better team maybe just miss it and get a good pick if uh, they hoped Pittsburgh uh, fell flat this year, which did not happen. They ended up being more surprising than people thought as well. They have their pick and their own. Uh, they kind of stacked it up. They also have Pittsburgh's third, but they ended up being great this year because uh, since Everson's come in, I think he's a guy right now uh, that would be one of the top three if you ended the season right now. Uh, when I did the midseason show with E-Money on my channel, uh, I put him as potentially the Jack Adams winner because nobody expected the Wild to be performing this well right now, especially when you're veterans in uh, Parise, you're looking to trade because he's kind of starting to fall out now after having a good last couple of years. This year, he's kind of just an afterthought in the lineup, um, which is kind of crazy to say, but that's kind of what he's become. You got Kirill the Thrill, who's going to win the Rookie of the Year if it ended right now, and he continues to do what he's doing. Uh, Everson's just made things work. Erickson X worked, whether he's on the first, second, or third line. Somehow he's made Ryan Hartman into a pretty good center um, rather than just a winger. And then Victor Rask is a guy that uh, he's put first through third line when he really should just be on the third line, but mm -hmm. it just worked well because he matches them with guys he can just chip pass it to, like Zuccarello, Kaprizov, or Johansson, or Fiala, and then they just fly down the ice and score. So he just is really smart, it seemed, with matching guys up. They got Jordan Greenway, Eric Sinek. They got a good young core developing. Uh, they brought in Sturm, who's a good fourth-line player, as an undrafted guy, as well as Bukestad as a good fourth-liner. So they kind of filled out their lineup very smartly this offseason. This is another team. The only thing I could see them possibly adding is maybe if they want to add another defenseman. Um, Dumba's out now, but even with Dumba in, you still have uh, a guy like uh, Hunt as your next uh, guy if somebody goes out who's in now, and Brad Hunt uh, hasn't been as impressive this year. So maybe like a 6-7 type defenseman on the market you might want to add to have defense depth that's a little bit more secure than Hunt. But other than that, um, unless if they find a trade partner for Zach Parise, I think this wild team is pretty much going to stay pat, and I also don't think they're going to find a trade partner for Zach Parise because of what Delhi said with past team. The flat cap is going to be extremely hard, unless if you're eating a lot of salary to trade Zach Parise. So I yeah. think they're just going to stay pat other than maybe a depth defenseman because goaltending was something coming into the season I would think if this team did surprise maybe needed to potentially get because Kockenden uh, would have needed another year to season that doesn't seem like the case whatsoever right, he seems right. Like he's fully ready now along with Talbot so that's what's put them into contention along with their impressive uh play from guys like Erickson Eck and others um I think this team deserves all the um, shout outs they can get this year and Everson deserves it as well if I'm them just stay with it get a depth defenseman maybe maybe another forward if you want to maybe re platoon out Bukestad and or a Strom or a Sturm but other than that don't do anything don't mess okay. with the way this team's there vibes you go. going I wouldn't mess with it at all there you go you heard it from the professor so now let's hear it from uh, Delhi. what do you think about yeah. Minnesota I think they stand pat too. Um, they have uh, they have an interesting situation coming up with Kaprizov. He's not. I mean, he's he's kind of a weird RFA situation where he can't be offer sheeted, but he's going to need a new contract, uh, and that's probably going to be a pretty at least a significant contract if they do a bridge deal or something to see uh, what he's got if he can do what he's doing consistently. 
Uh, so I think they maybe try to try to save some money. Don't don't make any major trades. Maybe yeah. tinker with a couple guys. But uh, similar to the Blues, you've got some big contracts uh, coming up in the off season. So maybe see what you have now. We're still in pandemic bizarro world. So uh, wait till things get a little more back to normal and and just try to get in and compete with what you've got right now. I think that's what they're what they're going for. I have to agree with you on that because when you look at the roster here, they got a lot of guys that are going to be up for contract next year. You know what I mean? And and they're kind of they're going to be you know looking to try to if they can save some money or get some money or earn some money or something. You know what I mean? So I'm of the ilk if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And right now Minnesota's doing pretty good. So uh, what do you think there, Perla? I think it's pretty likely that they stay pat. I know uh, Bill Guerin, uh, general manager of Minnesota, he is huge on draft and development. So I, if they they have two firsts, and I'm pretty sure they're going to want to keep them. Uh, and not, two they're thirds. Not, yeah, they're not going to want to be trading their first round picks at all right now. Uh, this is an organization that he came into that was in a very in a neutral situation for a long time they were just good enough to make the playoffs but not good enough to you know get draft picks so um he wants to keep those draft picks he's going to spend a lot of time making sure that 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 they grab the right players that can that they can be successful and i think that's his main focus right now the fact that they're in a playoff spot is a bonus and it's awesome and it is a huge uh a uh, round of applause for Evison, who should be in Coach of the Year talks, <laughs> I would think, that's doing fantastic work here. Um, uh, and also a lot of thanks to Capo Kakinen. But as we've known before, I said before that you show me, a, like the old adage, you show me a great coach, I'll show you a great goalie. But if you show me a great coach, I'll show you a coach well, who can make goalie, Talbot, who can, because Talbot, right. your Edmonton team, like Martin Jones, the Sharks did the Jones, ran him into – a grave six feet under, and then it took a couple teams to get him back back out, uh, being in shape to be a goalie again. They they might be a team that's a dark horse, not just for the Jack Adams, but Masterson for both of their goaltenders too with help. Yeah, but he's, he's helped these goaltenders be great. And that's a sign of a very good coach. So, uh, yeah, I think they would likely stay pat. The only thing I could ever could see them doing is if they got a rental big centerman, but there's not one out there. Yeah, you know, it would be a rental because they have forward, they have uh, some very good centers. Uh, that one one of which uh, Marco Rossi they drafted last year, coming up, and uh, I don't think they have first of all the uh, cap space. As Delhi said, they have players that they have to sign, like Kirill Kaprizov, and uh, they have a lot of con- big contracts like Parise and Ryan Suter that kind of has them cap strapped. So I don't see them wanting to get any term on a centerman to replace what they have there because they're going to they're going to have people to replace that within anyways. So yeah, yeah that's going to be the main focus here. Um, I don't think they're they're I think they're very well said standing pat is pretty much what they'll do unless they can do something like that like if they can yeah. find uh maybe if gets left all of a sudden wakes up and says you know what maybe i do want to try a cup this year you could make a little arrangement to give him a shot you know you'd have that veteran guy that can enter into the lineup and and help these guys possibly do some miraculous things in the playoffs or something like that. But barring something like that, I don't I don't see much okay. happening here because you don't want to be stealing uh, experience points for Joel er- Erickson Eck that is just coming into his own right now. Not a good idea to trample on that, right? Yeah, so exactly. Bringing- Putting them down in the lineup after having success like this seems counterproductive to me. So, okay, yeah, all right, I got you, I got you. So now we're gonna do the rapid fire here on the last two teams because they're obviously in the top two, and you know we're, we're kind of all going to that same ilk. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So the ne- the the next team here that we're gonna get into is the Colorado Avalanche. They've played thirty games. They are twenty eight and two with forty two points. Uh, so, uh, we're going to start off with, uh, let's start off with Perlo. What do you think about, uh, Colorado here? 
Well, first of all, Colorado could stay right the way they are right now and still win a cup. Okay. But the amazing thing is, is they've got cap space coming. Well, not co- like tons of cap space, but they do have cap space. So if they wanted to, they can add any way they want to. They they could add they could add to their defense, which they don't need. They they could yeah. add another center to uh, to put. Uh, I, I would say if they did anything, it would probably be another center here. Uh, Nazim Kadri seems to be kind of trending more to a third line center type thing. Uh, if and they could go around the league and find a center anywhere they want and be able to add, uh, you know, like they have the assets. I believe they have draft picks. They have prospects that they have so many prospects they almost don't need some of them. Like Martin Coutts going to have to move into the lineup here pretty soon. Uh, they could use him as a. Uh, as a uh, to dangle for a second, oh, yeah, line there you go. <laughs> uh, they could use their first this year, they could use their first next year. I mean, they don't have two, they don't have second rounders, so I, I don't think they'd want to. But if the right deal was there and they could get somebody where it's like, we are for sure, for sure, this will put us right over the top, yeah. then I think they'll do something like that for sure. But the great thing about uh, the Avalanches, they have so many options to do so many things. Yeah. Uh, Sakic has painted a palette of endlessness here, and uh, it's amazing. Amazing work he's done with this Agreed. with this roster. Okay. Uh, Joe, Professor Joe, give us a little quick fire here on what you think about Colorado and what they're going to do for the trade deadline. Um, I'm pretty much with Pirlo. I mean, they brought in... Look, when you have a goalie, like I've said in past videos I've done, um, when I did one with overtime heroics, hockey pockets, especially when we talked about the news of Johansson being traded, playing for a team that maybe is the one team that defensively pisses off their fans more than Ducks fans, um, which would be the Buffalo Sabres. (laughs) Um, So uh, I think it's hard to judge. In the minors, Jonas Johansson has had some success um, so I think um, seeing him have decent positioning and all that hood spud just for me personally watching him, I think that translating to a team that actually is one of the best ranked defenses uh, mm-hmm. should bring some success to him as a backup, which I think is going to be key for this team because Grubauer is a Vezina candidate right now, but gruby has been banged up before. And I think it's pivotal to be able to give him some rest as you come into the stretch run here. So he's fully firing on all cylinders yeah. by the time the playoffs hit. And Sackick's a smart GM, so him bringing in Johansson makes me more confident, too, in him looking good position-wise and just getting hung out to dry in that assessment with the Sabres because Sackick doesn't normally ever bring in somebody just because they need that position. He normally always brings in somebody because he sees something in them. <laughs> yeah. And they need, he's never one of those GMs that just brings in somebody just because. Just to bring so, him in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good sign for Johansson as well. Uh, Timmons is injured as a big prospect himself. Pierre mentioned Martin Cal. It's not even as big of a deal because you have Jacob McDonald, who's been mainly a minor league, uh, the, an undrafted guy that's been very good in the AHL his entire career, that now all of a sudden. Uh, He's only played one NHL game with the Panthers, mostly played with Binghampton, the Thunderbird, and Colorado Eagles. And now all of a sudden, since he's in Colorado, he misses in right well with the defense and looks like a perfectly fine uh, NHL defenseman. It's amazing what that Colorado Woodrow will do for you out there. You're playing Avalanche and your defense. Uh, So if I'm them, don't do anything because you're having guys. Whoever you call up, Logan O'Connor was good in the games he played. You can use him still. Everybody's fitting into your system. Bednor's a genius. Sackick's a genius. Don't do anything. Just let it go. Uh, You don't need it. And then Francois, I think, is still supposed to be back at some point by the playoffs. So you have a third goaltender that, other than just Hunter Miska with these other two, in a by the time I think the playoffs would start. So that'll give you a little bit more depth and a fully rested goaltender also that's pretty darn good coming back if he Mm -hmm. is actually come back so all right man Deli, lay it out for me man what do you think about what the haves are going to do uh for the trade deadline this year so yeah i don't think much but there is one potential move that i that i wonder if they might if they might explore i mean winners of seven games in a row 
you're pretty much peaking at the right time. I don't think there's much that needs to be done. But I'm not convinced that defensive move really uh, was, or sorry, the, the goalie move was their, was their solve. I mean, that was their Achilles heel last year. That was the, that was the problem with their, with their Stanley Cup run that, that ended up killing them. So uh, what I think they might do is, I mean, that is a good candidate for a Jonathan Quick trade. Uh, the Kings aren't really a, uh, the Kings, I don't think they'd be hesitant to trade Quick to Colorado because assuming things go back to normal, Colorado is not going to be uh, in their division next year, I think. Yeah, true. So yeah. Uh, the, the, the Avalanche would have to trade a roster player um, to make enough space for to, to, to fit Quick's uh, salary. Uh, but I think they could do it. And I, like we said before, the Kings aren't in a position where they would hesitate to retain salary for a couple of years if it means getting quick off of their, off of their books. So, uh, you can make it advantageous for the avalanche. Uh, but also don't forget the avalanche are going to have to shell out an Eric Carlson size contract in the off season for Kale McCarr. Uh, so there are definitely some, some hangups to that, but if they do do something, I'm not sure this Johansson trade is the end of their goalie trades, at least from from their experience last year. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. And That's I, actually it, a pretty good assessment by Delhi, just because he's another guy that Quick could go to if they can figure it out, due to the fact that Grosnick has been one of the better AHL goalies in his entire career, and in games has stepped up in the three to four games he's played in the NHL. So I feel like the Kings being in this period of trying to compete and not, if you get the right deal for quick, get a nice roster player from Colorado, maybe a forward that can help out the young guys uh, nurture into the league more. Uh, you would be maybe willing to do that. And then just like Rosnick be the veteran backup to Pedersen, who can still show him the ropes as a pro, just not as much as an NHL pro, but he's been around the game for a while. Okay. All right. Well, uh, it seems like they've got a lot of young goalies on the team now uh, already. You know what I mean? And apparently they don't have the same kind of confidence in some of these guys. <laughs> As to, I agree. I think somebody like that would be a perfect compliment to uh, a Colorado team that could that could be, you know, gearing up for a stretch run here. And, and a good veteran goaltender like that would be able to take some of the, the burden off of Grubauer, you know what I mean, and give him that rest and give that rotation, you know what I mean. So I like that idea too, but I, I'm also kind of the same spot where, you know what, gosh, this team has just been really exploding. They've been really playing well. So, okay, uh, I'm with you on that. All right, the last team in the Honda West is uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. And this team here has played 30 games. They have 22 wins, seven losses, and and one overtime. And I'll tell you what, uh, for 45 points they have. And they're one of the top teams in the league right now. They have some of the most points in the league right now. I think they're tied for second with a couple other teams that have 45 points. But either, either way you slice it. Uh, the Vegas Golden Knights, one of the best teams in the league right now. They're leading their division. Uh, we're going to give a quick little breakdown here. We'll start off with Joe. What do you think about the, the Vegas Golden Knights? Um, I think they're a team that the only move I could see the Vegas Golden Knights making might be for a center, just because they could be a team that they have a Carlson Stevenson's been over before him, and then he got no second. Now you have Patrick Brown uh, in there of late. I could see them getting a third or fourth line. Um center and then Cody Glass of course um is a guy that they for some reason scratch I mean I understand he hasn't been fully where you want him yet but I still wouldn't scratch a young guy when he's still uh, been playing solid on both ends in my opinion and is developing well to just put in like carriers of the world but uh that's their decision um I would say maybe a center. Other than that, this is similar to the Avalanche for me. Your defense is performing well. Uh, Leonard seems to kind of be settling out now. Flurry's another, speaking of Vezina candidates, uh, is definitely one of the leading guys right now. So everything's firing on all cylinders for you. The only thing you might need is a uh, bottom, like a third or fourth line center, because Stevenson's proven, at least in Vegas, he can play on your top two lines. And I think Washington's kicking themselves for not giving him more playing time when he was out there. But uh, they are another team to me. Don't do much if it ain't broke, like you say. Don't fix it. Yeah. Let this thing roll. Let Cody Glass up. Maybe you're giving him a headspace a couple of days. That's how I feel. Coglin's filled in well. 
they're a team like the Avalanche, whoever they asked to fill in for them from their minor leagues has stepped in well for however many games it was just because of how efficient their system is and how smartly put together that team uh, has been from Peter DeBoer and Kelly McCrimmon, just like the Avalanche were from Sokak and Bednar. So I would say don't do much other than maybe one center. You don't okay. want to mess up their mojo either, just like the Wild. Just <laughs> yeah. like the Wild. Yeah, don't mess that up. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Don't mess that up. All right, well, let's go with uh, Professor Joe. What do you? Or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Perla Wisdom. What do you think about uh, about the Vegas Golden Knights and and where they're at right now? What do you think they're going to do with the trade deadline? Um, well, first of all, it's Vegas. Like you, they they'll whatever you say, they'll probably surprise you. <laughs> they, they you never know. Like I, I, it makes sense to me that um, if they're going to do anything. Uh, a center would definitely be where I'm looking to go or, you know, some depth pieces and stuff like that. But nobody's afraid. Nobody's not afraid to go for the home run more than Vegas. They've shown it their whole existence right now. So um, if there was some, a number one center out there that was falling off the vine and like, I could even see them, you know, working out some sort of a deal with Chicago to get Jonathan Taves or something like, see, like I wouldn't put anything past them uh, to go to go for it in some way. Uh, okay. I wouldn't. I, I I'm not saying they should do that or whatnot. Who? What am I to say? Vegas has never done anything conventionally. You know, they make moves where you go like, really? What? Are you okay? Kind of. You know, <laughs> like what about the future? Uh, whatever. We'll figure that out later. I guess I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, they don't do things very conventionally, so um, I could. They could just hold pat and keep on going here, or they could do some unconventional, weird, not weird necessarily, but exciting. I think would be better move. That's a good word um, to put at it. One guy that I, for some reason, think that they may talk about, you know, may look at, if, assuming that uh, Vancouver isn't in it anymore, is for some reason a guy like Brandon Sutter. Seems like a guy that would fit in there with them, their type of uh, the way they like to have their type of character players like um, like uh, Peter Angelo, Stone, all that. All I do know is they will definitely reach for the stars. They will if they find yeah. a place for it, if they see they they say to themselves, this is going to win us a cup, they'll do it. Yeah. And uh they could even go after a guy like Matt Duchesne or something like that. I was that. just Who about knows? to say, two guys falling out of favor are on Nashville. Maybe they're call over to Nashville. Johansson right. and Duchesne. Yes, like, they could take it. Duchesne. In. <laughs> Duchesne has been a character where um, he hasn't fit and stuff like that. But when you've got the kind of character they have with Pacioretty, Stone, uh, Reeves, guys like that, that, that players – feed off of and Duchesne seems to be a guy who feeds off of people rather than creates the presence or energy. Yeah. You just never know. I just think you like and you look at their cap space and say how and you go, well they never bothered them before. <laughs> you know they they just trade another player away or whatever. They'll whatever. figure it away. They yeah. use their imagination. So I'm not going to say really what they uh, there's and they could do anything. Vegas could really do anything. Okay. All right. I got you. All right, Dally. What, what do you think, man? Do you think these guys are going to do anything spectacular or what do you think? I think they stand pat. Uh, they've got a, as close to a bulletproof roster as you have. They don't have the vulnerability at goalie like Colorado still has. And if not for a freak call a couple of years ago against San Jose, they might be looking for their second Stanley cup. I know they had a few rounds to go. That was only the first round, but they looked really good uh, that year. So making all those moves, those kind of out of the box thinking big splashes hasn't worked for them in the past. I mean, maybe this is the year they think we've got what we need. Maybe we keep this thing going. We ride it out as they like to say in Vegas, let it ride, uh, and, and see what you're doing. I mean, I, I really think that this is the year that they just say, what else do we have? I mean, what else do we have to lose? Let's just keep right. these guys together and let them, let them win. I can't argue with you on that, and and I do agree. I think maybe, if anything, some depth, but for the most part, you know, uh, they have been building this team since day one, and they've been building this team since day one from an unconventional method to begin with because they this whole team started off with an expansion draft. So right away, you're already dealing with some pretty 
interesting names to say the least. Okay. And over the years now, some, some guys have been moved in and out and things like that. And, you know, I, I think that's exactly with what you pointed out, Dilly. Their their goaltending situation has been nailed down. And when you nail that down, that opens things up for the whole rest of the team. That opens things up for your chances. That excuse me, that opens things up for the D man. You know that the D can pinch a little bit more or or come up a little bit more because you know you got that goalie back there. I mean, you know, that just kind of opens up things a little bit more. Well, and so Go a ahead. closing point for me before we close out is Vegas is one of those teams that just shows people and proves to people, along with Colorado, who mixes in offensive and defensive defensemen with the best of them, that you still can't just trade or draft like a lot of teams think you can in the speed skill league, mainly oh, offensive yeah. defensemen, and then try to build your core around all that with just two guys. For example, San Jose, you either bring in or draft all offensive guys and then just have Ferraro and Kuznev, who's a rookie, try to, um, to be the guys that uh, d- d- uh, step up for you. Where in Vegas with Martinez, great defensive guy. McNabb, great defensive guy. Same with Holden and Hag and White Cloud. You got Theodore to kind of do the offense. Martinez is also still a pretty good passer, so he can also, if you want, uh, be on your power play for that perspective as well as McNabb, more from, where Theodore is more from the scoring perspective, potentially. They just mixed it in so well. This team just proves to teams like the Flyers, for example, you need to have guys more mixed in that are just defense and not going to join the rush necessarily, just like Colorado I got you. and yeah, Vegas I got you. has. So I think uh, that just goes to show this: these teams that are like this should stay pat. And another team that I think the reason they became so surprising is that's exactly how Minnesota's played this year. They played some of their defenders will jump into the attack. More other guys like Susi and others will be more of just the don't do anything stupid defenders that just get the play done. So right. I, I think that's um, we've seen success from this West division and it's been one of the most interesting to watch. That was just my closing point on the division as a whole. All right, cool. Well, thank just, you very much. Just tell Flurry to make sure his agent doesn't have access to his phone during crunch time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, this, so far, Leonard's only played seven games, so if they keep going the street, they're going. Yeah, Flurry's going to play uh, like 95% of the uh, games. To see. Yeah, just throw that out there. Oh, yeah. All right, well, I'll tell you what, man. We, we, we covered every single team in the division. Um, this was uh, really amazing. Um, it was really insightful. I think we, we covered so many things in this, and there was so much information in here that how could you not um, – check this out i mean first of all we had the man from from the out west right here dropping in on us thank you very much Deli. how can we get a hold of you or can we get all of your great stuff i mean you have the the lost uh teams podcast how's that going and how can we get a hold of you yeah lost teams podcast is going great we actually did an episode with uh kevin tyson who wrote a book about the seattle metropolitans which is the first team to win the stanley cup uh, from the united states way back in nice. the 1910s which was cool um i also uh you can find that all the all the podcast outlets i also am a rotating co-host for totally offsides which is a ducks podcast that you can kind of find in all the same places uh, and then freelance writing. I, I had an article published in the LA Times about a month ago covering the Ducks uh, uh, goal song and that kind of history. So all those places you can find me and Twitter, of course. Awesome. Cool. Thank you very much, man. Man, really, really appreciate you jumping on here, man. Really appreciate that. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Perlo, how can we get a hold of you? Where can we get all your stuff? Well, one of the places you can get a hold of me is that very same podcast that you were talking about. We, I did one of those. Those were fantastic. Oh, you got to check them out. <laughs> <laughs> that, Thank you. That was, that was a, those are really cool. Uh, and, uh, yeah, of course, Steel Flyers All Sports Network, man. Go check it out. It is awesome. And you can catch me in at uh, between one or 3 and 5 Eastern Daily on the uh, – on just go look up My NHL Pearls of Wisdom – you can find me there on YouTube uh, associated with the Steel Flyers Network. I do a live show there two hours a day, five days a week. Yeah, man, and, good stuff. Uh, yeah, those are the two major places. If you want to find out everything else about me, just go there. I'll tell you all about it. We have <laughs> great we have great chats with everybody who's in there, and we do predictions and awesome. uh, for the on all that stuff. Give you give you some sort of swag, I guess. You'd there you say. go. Yeah, so, good deal. Yeah. Fun. Well, thanks very much for coming on here, man. I really appreciate that. We're going to get you out here just in time so you can be on your uh, 3 o'clock show here, it appears. 
So, uh, Professor Joe, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for all the great insight. Why don't you uh, tell us how we can get a hold of you and where we can find all your great stuff? Uh, yeah, I have the Sports Fanatic News YouTube page that uh, Steele and Pirlo aren't a lot. Delhi was on an episode in the last month uh, that we did on the California, the California burrito, we called it, who would uh, <laughs> win that. Taste uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, and he just made a great uh, fun fact point to close the podcast on, too. If Seattle wins the Cup, they wouldn't be the first Seattle team to win the Cup because the Metropolitans did back in the 1910s, where it's not like Vegas, where Vegas would actually would be the first, first Vegas, Vegas. To yeah, win yeah. the Cup. Yeah, so that is an interesting fact that Delia uh, just sprinkled in on us uh, at the end of this podcast, and we Love thank it. him. Uh, joining us, uh, you can check me out on Twitter, like just like Delia said, Twitter. Um, platforms the best to kind of contact me at jj borick 26 and then when i can i definitely appear on a steel flyers uh youtube page and my stuff's on steelflyers.com and check out flyers nitty gritty if you're a flyers fan as well uh great stuff over there but i thank uh you all for having me on and i thank you all uh for joining this was a really fun video talking about the western division you got it man thank you guys all very much uh this is uh steel flyers uh, from the Steel Flyers All Sports Network. You can catch me on Twitter at Steel Flyers 52 Thank you all very much for joining us. Just remember, folks, stay strong, stay safe, and hang tough.